Good afternoon. Welcome to the Ohio edition of our state webinar series, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some logistics to help make this a good experience. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow at the top of that panel allows the panel to shrink and reopen. You'll see a question section of the control panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel. You can then type your questions and comments in there. We will see them and are allowing plenty of time for uh, questions during and at the end of the presentation. We are also recording the webinar and will send the link to everyone who has registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I'm Chris Coffin. I'm American Farmland Trust's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me are Brian Brandt and Brian Bordage. Brian Brandt is AFT's Agricultural Conservation Innovations Director and is based here in Ohio. Brian Bordage is Michigan-based and is focused on building our National Agricultural Land Network in the Midwest. For those of you not familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a very quick introduction. We are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We work to save the land that sustains us by protecting farmland, promoting sound farming practices, and recognizing that it's not farmland without farmers, keeping farmers on the land. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from direct farmland protection projects to soil health initiatives, to training service providers on land access and tenure strategies, to state and federal policy development and advocacy. In Ohio, we are actively implementing programs that help promote sound farming practices, including education and outreach on soil health for farmers and non-operating landowners, and innovative programs to incentivize adoption of soil health practices. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, DC. And let me now turn it over to Brian Brandt. Thank you, Chris. Um, as we are starting the call here or the webinar, I'm delighted to be joined today by a number of value partners, including the Ohio Department of Agriculture, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, Coalition for Ohio Land Trust, and several land trust partners, including the Tecumseh Land Trust, Cardinal Land Conservancy, Three Valley Conservation Trust, Licking Land Trust, Cuyahoga Valley Countryside Conservancy, the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, several ap academic institutions, including Ohio University and Ohio State University, USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, and many others. Thank you again for all of you joining us today. I'd also like to recognize and thank NRCS especially for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. Um, and finally, I would also like to recognize Jill Clark with Ohio State's John Glenn College of Public Affairs for serving uh, on our Farms Under Threat Advisory Committee. Uh, she provided some valuable insights and uh, and input to our process in developing um, our farms under threat analysis. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's talk now about the findings from our report. Today we're focusing on the state of the states, which is the second in this research series. 
State of the States paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. We used a multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. For those of you who may not have joined us for our launch event, let me touch very quickly on our national findings. From 2001 to 2016, a period of historically low housing starts, the U.S. nonetheless converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's the equivalent to all the land planted in the U.S. to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low-density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered, large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized just how big of a threat it is. And importantly, more than a third of the land converted, about four and a half million acres, was what we have identified as nationally significant land, land best suited for intensive food and crop production. As you can see from this next map, agricultural land conversion is a growing problem across the U.S and no longer confined to just large metropolitan areas. Small cities are sprawling, and the proliferation of farmettes and ranchettes on their outskirts has created hot spots of conversion in virtually every state. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's now dive into the data available for Ohio on our new interactive website built just for this project. And we will be ably assisted in our cruise through the website by our colleague and website navigator, Beth Fraser. Thank you, Beth. Let's start with pointing out the tab over here, the reports and data tab. This is where you'll find the fact sheets that describe much of the methodology used in the project. And if you would like to get access to the geospatial data we used, we are making that available. You go to this geospatial data layers tab where Beth has the pointer. That will take you to a form where you can fill out the information that you are looking for, and we will be in touch and let you know when and how it will be available. So now let's go to the drop down menu and choose Ohio. Here you can see both the spatial data and the policy scorecard. We're gonna start with the spatial data, but before we actually dig in, um, we would like to show you the downloadable highlight summaries, if you would, Beth. These we created, there's both a spatial one and a policy one. We hope these will be useful. They are easily downloadable, even if you have um, slow Wi-Fi, which I do, um, that provides you with the pertinent high points. Um, these could be used for newsletters, for infographics, for uh, reporter, conversations, for conversations with policymakers. We hope that you will use them. We hope you will find them helpful. <clears throat> so going back to the four categories of spatial data we've created, we're going to start with land use, land cover and use. Farms Under Threat, the state of the states, uses multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the U.S. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low density residential development. It also includes a first ever attempt to spatially identify woodland associated with a farm. Our mapping shows 15.3 million acres of agricultural land in Ohio, including 11.5 million acres of cropland, 1.85 million acres of pasture land and 1.9 million acres of woodland associated with the farm. So moving on to PVR values, 
For farms under threat, we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the U.S. This map shows the range of these PBR values across the state. Higher PBR land, uh, higher PBR values are the darker the green, the higher the value, and higher values indicate higher suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. So let's go on to nationally significant land. These PBR values were used to identify nationally significant land. This map shows those lands in Ohio. You see that nearly 11 million acres of agricultural land falls into this category, or about 72% of the state's agricultural land. About 10 million of these acres are cropland with 534,000 in pasture and 376,000 in woodland. We did this in part to show that the loss of this highly productive land has both economic and environmental implications. When nationally significant land is impacted by development, intensive food production is pushed to more marginal lands. This has economic impact because input costs typically then are higher and crop yields are typically lower. It has environmental implications because soils on these more marginal lands degrade more quickly. So let's, oh, and before we do, Beth, if you could show the satellite image. Um, we just want people to know that you can toggle between these two types of maps. Um, you can see then under the satellite that again, these bright green are the nationally significant lands and it's just a useful way to see that um, there's another way of looking at this data, uh, if you would prefer. So let's go to conversion. The data looks at a 15 year period from 2001 to 2016. Again, a period of historically low housing starts with a deep recession in its midst. We mapped the conversion of agricultural land to two types of land use. The first is urban and highly developed land use. This includes the traditional culprits in farmland conversion. So expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas typically found in cities and towns. But the category also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites. So this category will include oil and well pads and solar panel installations. The second type is low density residential development or LDR. This is the first effort of its kind to quantify the extent of large lot housing on the agricultural land base. LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. You can see that the vast majority of conversion, if you go back out Beth, just to that, where you can see the numbers, that's 202,800 acres or 65% over this time frame, was to low density residential development. It doesn't mean that there is no active agriculture on land designated as LDR, there may well be. And some of that agricultural production may be very productive. We know that small farm parcels can be both productive and, part and profitable. But we also know that LDR tends to be a transitional land use. Land in Ohio that was considered LDR in 2001 was 12 times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. And we know that continued conversion to LDR increases management challenges for producers who have to deal with farming in and around non-farm neighbors. So total agricultural land converted over this period was just over 312,000 acres. Cropland accounted for about 173,000 acres of that, followed by pasture land with 78,000 and woodland with 52,000 acres. And then looking at the PVR values of the land converted, not surprisingly, given Ohio's um, high percent of nationally significant land, 
nearly 90% of the land that was converted was considered nationally significant. So with that, let me stop and turn it over to Brian Brandt for some perspectives about the spatial findings. Thank you, Chris. Um, Beth, if you could actually um, zoom in to, um, I guess, the area northwest of Columbus. Uh, this is an area that's actually significant um, for me, um, I live in the central Ohio area and actually have or am implementing a project called Farming for Cleaner Water in the Upper Scioto River watershed. Um, so if, and if even Beth, if you can zoom in just a little bit more, um, yeah, to the west there. Um, we are implementing a project, like I said, in the Upper Scioto River watershed farming for cleaner water. This is a source water protection based project, but we know um, that the areas uh, of Northwest Columbus, so we have Dublin and Powell and Delaware, and then moving on to Marysville, these are some of the um, fastest growing areas in Ohio and actually across the nation. So there will be continued um, pressure on farmland moving northwest um, and around central Ohio as well, but northwest into the upper Scioto watershed. I want to point out that the upper Scioto watershed is the source water for over a million uh, people in the central Ohio area. And that, um, you know, it's, it's a valued resource um, for central Ohio uh, in terms of drinking water. And so, you know, it's important that we protect those areas um, uh, for farmland. Uh, it's needed for food and farming and actually protection, protecting water quality as well. So, so if we can protect lands in those areas um, and uh, help farmers implement farming practices, it's only going to help in terms of, of source water protection for central Ohio. Um, and actually, if you can zoom up to the Mansfield area, Beth, there's one specific thing I wanted to point out um, and, and zoom in a little bit more so we can see a, a little more fine detail. Um, Mansfield is actually an area where there has been um, quite a bit of low density residential development. Um, yeah, and as Chris mentioned, you know, those are areas that are very likely to transition to, you know, high density development into the future. So, so when we think about, you know, conversion to areas that will not support agriculture at all into the future, you know, we can see that those orange areas will very likely convert to, you know, high density urban development moving forward into the future. Um, so that is something that's taken place at, at a great amount in the Mansfield area and in other areas in Ohio, if we can actually zoom back down to, to the upper Scioto watershed area, large amounts of that that are taking place around the Marion areas in, in the watershed. So, you know, those really kind of stand out um, across the state as areas that will convert to, you know, high density urban development in the future. Um, that's, I think, what I wanted to mention right now. Uh, I'll hand it back to Chris, and she can move on a little bit more to talking about the policy scorecard analysis that AFT completed. Great. Thank you, Brian. That was really helpful. <laughs> um, before we turn to the policy scorecard, we want to stop, actually, and get some input from all of you. We are interested in your perspectives on what you think will drive agricultural land conversion over the next 10 to 20 years. Understanding this will help determine what policy responses will be most valuable. Um, please note that you can um, vote for more than one. And if you are having trouble voting, you may need to, you may be in full screen mode and may need to go out of it to be able to vote. So we'll take a minute and let folks vote.
Hope. Great, thanks, Beth. So um, this is interesting. Um, like many of the other state webinars we have done before, folks feel that um, more and poorly planned housing, commercial industrial development is going to continue to be a conversion driver. Um, but interesting, the number of you who think that generational transfer and the challenges around it, both uh, as to the actual transfer and the ability of the next generation to get onto land, um, is increasingly a driver. So um, we're going to talk about that in the context of the policy scorecard. So let's turn to that now. Our intent with the scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address the three main drivers of agricultural land conversion, at least to date. So that's poorly planned development, um, weak agricultural viability um, at certain sectors at certain times, and the fact that agriculture is, land is most vulnerable when it transfers between generations. <clears throat> While AFT has been at the forefront of federal and state policy development around farm and ranch land retention and protection since our founding, this is our first effort at a state policy scorecard. We know that there are many ways that states support agriculture, and this is not an attempt to score them all. In fact, we know that there are many grants, loan, marketing programs, economic development authorities that support for agriculture, uh, a cooperative extension service that states invest in agriculture in a number of different ways. We looked at six policies and programs that are specifically focused on uh, the land and some aspect of the land. So these six policies and programs included um, first purchase of agricultural conservation easement programs or PACE. These are often known as farmland preservation or purchase of development right programs. They are voluntary programs that compensate landowners who choose to place an agricultural conservation easement on their property. In Ohio, the Department of Ag administers the Local Agricultural Easement Purchase Program, which provides funds to entities for the purchase of easements. We looked at land use planning and growth management. We understand that land use planning is driven largely at the county and municipal level, and the suite of tools available to those county and local governments to support compact development and protect agricultural land must be robust. But states can play an important role in steering and supporting these decisions in a way that supports the agricultural land base. So we wanted to measure how well states are doing in that respect. We looked at property tax relief for agricultural land. These are programs that reduce property taxes paid on agricultural land in recognition that working lands require far less in municipal services than residential development. In Ohio, this is the Current Use Ag Value Program. We looked at agricultural district programs. Again, there are only about 14 states that have them. Those that do uh, encourage landowners to form special areas to support agriculture. Protections and incentives offered differ by program. Some protect agricultural landowners with limits on annexation, limits on eminent domain, and protection from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure. Some, like Ohio, offer tax incentives. Some require district enrollment to participate in PACE programs. So we looked at Ohio's both the ag districts and agricultural security areas. Farm link programs connect farm seekers with farmers and landowners who want their land to stay in agriculture. Administered by public or private entities, they offer a range of services and resources from online real estate postings to technical assistance, trainings, and educational resources. So you note there's no score here for um, Ohio. That's because we included only state-supported programs. And lastly, state leasing. State leasing programs are those that make state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture. Sometime that's their primary purpose. More often, agricultural use is secondary to generating income for a public purpose or for protecting wildlife habitat. 
So let's see then how Ohio scores relative to other states. Um, you see here that it's above the median for its PACE program and property tax relief. It's below the median for land use planning and state leasing and at the median for agricultural districts. And I should mention that the median is um, for those states that have these programs, not for all states. So the website allows you to dive into the factors behind the score. So we're gonna do that now. Um, we're gonna select the program or policy tab and we're gonna start with PACE. So Ohio gets high marks for the number of easements it acquires, for its annual monitoring, and for requiring an affirmative covenant to farm as an easement deed term. And it leads the Midwest in funding per capita for its program at 22 cents per capita. But you can see the seven, if you go to the acres protected to acres converted, um, that suggests that Ohio's program is just not keeping pace with the state's rate of conversion. And I should note, Beth, if you would go down to the bottom, that you can see here what we included in these scores and how we scored them. So these uh, factors down here will give you a sense of what was included in the score. Um, before we move on to land use planning, I do want to mention the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, which provides an important source of matching funds for Ohio farmland protection, as does the USDA's Regional Conservation Partnership Program. We hope that the changes made to both programs in the 2018 Farm Bill will continue to improve their utility for farmland protection. We will be reaching out over the summer through the National Agricultural Land Network, as Brian will talk about, to solicit feedback on how these programs are working for partners. So let's go to land use planning. We understand that land use planning is driven largely at the county and municipal level. Our intent with this piece of the scorecard, again, is to look at how every state is steering or supporting decisions that support the agricultural land base. And Ohio could do more on this front. States that scored well in this policy arena support local governments in developing comprehensive plans. States with high scores also have state goals, both around compact development and around retaining their agricultural land base. And those states then require consistency between local comprehensive plans and those state goals. So looking at property tax relief, Ohio is fourth in the country in acres enrolled in its current ag use value program, which is great. Ohio also gets points for its having withdrawal penalties. Some states that scored higher with this policy use those withdrawal penalties to help fund their farmland protection efforts. Moving on, we have just a couple more here. Moving on to agricultural districts. Here, Ohio gets very good points for many of the provisions of the agricultural security areas, um, including the restrictions on non-farm development, protections from public conversion, and offering tax incentives. Where it loses in points relative to other states is simply in the amount of land enrolled. And I believe that the amount of land enrolled for Ohio was considered only the ag security areas, not ag districts as a whole. So that's worth keeping in mind in thinking about that number. So then lastly, on state leasing, um, we just, we put this in here um, because we think that, um, we think that it's an important mechanism for identifying new land access opportunities, especially smaller plot parcels in and near urban areas. States that received high scores in this category have done a comprehensive inventory of state-owned land that could be made available for farming and then promote the use of that land through a transparent process. 
Um, I know here for Ohio that there's a zero on the acres leased. I don't know whether there were no acres being leased for farmers or simply we were unable to get that information. If anybody knows and wants to include that on a comment line, that would be great. Um, and let me finish by making one point about um, farm linking programs. We note that the Ohio Ecological Food and Farming Association and Countryside Conservancy both have programming around farm link, which is terrific. Um, we included this here, not necessarily because we think that every state has to have a farm link program, but because we believe that the type of services that farm linking provide, which is helping to steer and make successful transitions between older farmers or older farmland owners and farm seekers is hugely important. And as everybody noted, will just continue to become increasingly important. And the way that we feel that some of those programs will be mo most robust is if there is state support or state involvement in those types of efforts. So I hope that was a helpful cruise through the findings. If you have questions, please write them down. And as we go out of the website, we're going to launch a poll which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on for Ohio. My apologies, you see that farm link and um, state leasing are not included here. We didn't have enough room. We should have actually put one in instead of the need more information. But um, if you think that uh, either or both of those should be at the top of the list, please feel free to put those in on a comment um, and you can select one or more. So we'll take a minute to see the results here. Great. Okay, Beth. Um, terrific. Land use planning at the top of the list, followed by PACE, which could mean, I'm assuming, an uh, effort to see increased funding, tweaks to the program, could be many a number of things, but it's good to know um, the Agricultural Land Network will be hosting a series of policy webinars beginning um, in early fall, which we hope will be a way for those of you who want to learn more about specific policy elements. We will be focusing, um, given how many people have said that land use planning and PACE programs um, are important to them, that these webinars will focus on what has made that planning and what has made those PACE programs that are at the top of our scoring um, so successful. Um, one thing missing, Beth, we can go out and back to the PowerPoint. One thing missing from our spatial analysis is protected agricultural land. That's because there is not a comprehensive national data layer focused on ag land protection. So we are building this new database now if you have not an IC, quite a bit of green in Ohio, um, but if you have not heard from us and you hold agricultural conservation easements, please do let us know by adding a comment in the question panel and we will be back in touch to get that information from you. So um, let's pause now and I think Brian Bordage has been looking at questions and will pose them now. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you so much for your participation and thanks Chris and Brian for your uh, explanations to date. We do not have um, a lot of questions, but we have a couple of comments I want to share and then a question that I thought I would pose to you, Chris. Um, one is, one comment about um, land use planning is the um, the recognition that there's a huge gap in awareness between um, rural ag planning needs and a lot of the people consulting in the 
um, land use planning area. So um, that's something that um, we can certainly pay attention to and folks in Ohio ought to, ought to also be talking about um, with their friends. Well, let, me just, let me just jump in on that, Brian. Sure. That is something that AFT recognizes. Um, and we have heard uh, through this webinar series that there is a very clear need and interest on those tools that are around agricultural land use planning and what makes for um, type of planning and zoning that is um, uh, useful in rural areas and ones that farmers and landowners can be supportive of. Um, this is going to be an increased focus on ours over the next year to provide much more um, technical assistance in this arena and we'll be doing so through the network. Fabulous. Uh, no, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, one is a technical question, which I think is worth sharing with the group in that um, some people are having um, questions about how to download the summary sheets. So if you could maybe just um, talk about that, the keystrokes needed to do that, Chris, for folks, that would be great. Well, actually, I'm going to defer. So maybe, well, Beth and I, Beth, I think is probably going to do it right now, is to go if you see here so whoops go um if beth go back to the web site because that's the downloaded version but show them again you see that download ohio conversion summary it is on the spatial mapping page just look for that there should be and then same with the ohio with the scorecard both of those, there's that little download tab right there um, that you should be able to reach them. And I tell you what, when we send around the registrate, when we send around the recording of the webinar, we'll also send those um, policy highlights, the policy and the spatial highlight summaries. Okay, another question we have, thank you. Um, is uh, whether or not there is a measure of how much ag land was lost specifically to oil and gas uses and also that um, solar array questions are a newer concern but are becoming a larger concern and the the uh, the participant is asking if this was something that aft was already seeing so sort of two questions one about oil and gas impact in our mapping and then also um the question about uh increased concerns with solar rape and well so let me um like if, i'll take a stab at that and then if either of you brian's would like to add to it um you're welcome to so in terms of the um er so solar and oil and gas um, infrastructure would show up, as I mentioned, in the urban and highly developed land use. Um, we didn't pull it out separately. So I think that what you would have to do is to figure out whether um, it is included somewhere is to go to somewhere where you know that there are either well pads or oil, I mean, some kind of pads or a large scale solar installation and see if you see that um, on the on the map. It should show up in the satellite version, but um, we did not pull that information out separately. Um, and yes, we are very aware that both um, non-renewable and renewable energy development um, is an increasing threat on to conversion. Now in some cases, we also recognize how um, important it is for the economic viability of farms and ranches to have that opportunity, particularly for renewable energy for on-farm use. Where it gets complicated is if it's large scale and it's not for just on-farm use. Um, and there we are, and it's part of why the 
reason for having this nationally significant land and looking at the at the quality of the land is to be able to make the point that if you're going to do large scale solar or other type of renewable energy development you need to try and make it as compact as possible and on um, marginal land to the extent possible we do have some guidelines that we are developing that is um, focused on how you might do solar siting we will make a link to that available when we send resources back out. Um, so I don't know, Brian's, if you have other things to add there. Just, uh, I see this as an increasing concern. I was recently involved in an ongoing conversation between some researchers at the University of Michigan and others who are looking to do an analysis of um, sort of how to do um, to develop best practices essentially for where uh, and and probably more importantly where not it makes sense to locate uh, solar arrays in or around agricultural land and then how to do that so appreciate the question yeah and I, I will just add this is Brian Brandt that you know it's definitely something that is on our radar and <clears throat> You know, AFT is working as we move forward to, like like Chris mentioned, um, to develop guidance recommendations around around that and making folks aware of of the issue. So I think Chris did a pretty good job of of a, a kind of explaining that and and how AFT is addressing that. All right, thanks. I think that's um, that's a good summary. There are some related questions in here um but uh i really appreciate everyone's input um and we can uh move on from there the um the, the next thing i want to talk about is aft's um response uh, to the report um and some of the other uh, outcomes as a result of this work. First of all, I want to say that time is not on our side in saving our farm and ranch land. Um, that's why AFT just announced this bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. We know that to get to this goal, we will need to lock arms with many partners and practitioners on this call and from all across the US who are also deeply concerned about saving the land that sustains us. Next slide, Beth. Thank you. And here are some of the ways that AFT will be strengthening its commitment to farmland protection, um, you can see those on the slide. I wanna speak specifically relative to the commitment to provide new leadership in key locations. One of the things that AFT has already developed is a new position for a Midwest farmland protection manager whose role will be to further advance and strengthen farmland protection programming in the Midwest region to which Ohio is vitally important. And then second, I wanted to mention uh, the new National Agricultural Land Network that Chris has also mentioned, and that AFT is committed to providing technical assistance, education, policy development, research activities to help all farmland protection practitioners in the field. We, ho we hope that this will foster beneficial relationships between farmland protection professionals from small land trusts, conservation districts, all the way up and through state level programs like the PACE program in Ohio and everything in between. We have one more slide, maybe not. Um, yeah, okay. So 
some of the common um, things here you can see that um, we're looking at what can um, states specifically do. Um, one of the conversations that I've been having with some of the farmland protection practitioners and other land protection professionals in o Ohio is the opportunity uh, to even further engage land trusts and other land protection organizations specifically in the protection of farmland. So we want to look at how we can um, support organizations who may have the expertise to protect farmland but are not yet engaged in that activity with the support and tools they need to do that. That's something that we'll be pursuing through the National Agland Network and we are going to be uh, announcing soon some uh, education and technical assistance sessions to start later this summer and then proceed through the fall and spring, uh, specifically here in the Midwest region. I think that's it, Chris. Hand it back Great. to you. Great. Um... Thank you for that, Brian. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So if people have any, please um, uh, please put them in and I'm looking I'm as we're talking. Um, one question that is how do you actually get to the website for the report itself? If you go back to that reports and data tab that we showed you on at the beginning, there is a link to the full report there as well, as well as to a much shorter executive summary. Um, so you can do it that way, or you can go to our basicfarmland.org website and type in um, farms under threat, and it should come up as well. Um, a couple of other comments um, from Krista McGaugh with uh, Tecumseh Land Trust, and I just want to stop and um, uh, mention that Krista has agreed to join our National Agricultural Land Network, for which we are very grateful. Um, she writes in here that right now solar arrays are being planned on prime land in Ohio, as much as 2,000 contiguous acres. Um, 2,000 contiguous acres is a significant chunk of farmland. And I would just mention one other thing on the solar arrays. Um, we are looking to do some research with others around dual use solar because we can see the, um, the prospect that dual use could be um, potentially a win-win if you can really do um, profitable agriculture in and around solar arrays. To date, there is not a whole lot of research that suggests that that is very viable and it tends to also increase the footprint of those solar developments to allow. So this is an area where um, we know that people are very interested, as are we, and we are looking um, to work with some researchers on understanding more about what makes for effective dual-use solar. Um, there is a question here that uh, maybe either of you, Brian, might know. I don't. Is there a state effort to create collaboration between agricultural land zoning and um, and county and city planners dialogue around comprehensive statewide planning. I don't know if either of you know that, and if not, maybe we'll wait a minute and see if anybody else does and wants to answer in writing. Do either of you? I, I do not. This is Brian Brandt. I, I do not. Um, I'm hoping <laughs> that maybe somebody would uh, have a little bit more information on that, that than I do. And this is Brian Bordage. I unfortunately do also do not know that for Ohio. Right. One thing I would encourage folks to do because 
to the degree that that's happening here in Michigan, it's most, mostly been at the behest of our state um, agricultural commission. Um, I don't know the precise name of the equivalent entity in Ohio, but I assume there is some sort of um, policy guiding body. Um, so um, anyhow, uh, that might be a way to request and 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 impart the importance of those kinds of um, that kind of work. Um, Krista is mentioning here that it's been since around 2000 that there was some work underway, but of, for, unfortunately there was not money specifically for planning. So, um, uh, you know, perhaps it's time to re-energize that conversation with the state. Great. Okay. And I think we will, um, this one, Brian Brandt, might be one that you can offer, um, which is how are we collaborating with livestock sector organizations to develop tools for identifying land critical for facilities and even nutrient management? You want to take that one on? Sure. Um, well, I, I can tell you one of the things that we're doing, and, and it's probably on a on a smaller scale, um, but in the Upper Scioto River watershed, for example, um, you know, we're doing multiple things that that try to get at that. So we are actually doing a watershed analysis um, to understand, you know, the inputs um, from different sources of nutrients into the watershed also looking at how the land is being used in the watershed um, overall and in the types of practices the types of things that can be done you know not only from you know a land use uh, perspective and and understanding those critical areas you know where livestock are you know where they can be situated but also you mentioned nutrient management in the question here but what are the impacts of nutrient management um, from those areas? So then, you know, we can target activities, you know, once we have a better understanding of kind of all those variables, we can target activities, whether it's thinking about siting, planning, or, you know, um, investing dollars in, in, you know, best management practices and other practices that mitigate the impacts of those sites and those facilities. So, so it's something that, you know, we're undergoing on a smaller scale in one specific watershed. You know, we think it's something that can be scaled up and repeated over other areas in other areas of Ohio. So, you know, getting kind of our feet wet in, in this one smaller watershed area and, 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 and growing from there. So kind of a longer answer, but, but, but at least that's a little bit of what we're doing uh, already in Ohio. Okay. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to stop there and um, take a couple of minutes to talk about the Farmland Information Center and the National Agland Network. Um, and then if we have any final questions, we can get back to them. Um, I also do want to launch one last poll, and why don't we do that now, Beth? As we are... Um, um, expanding programming for this new network, we are very interested in the type of technical assistance that you all are most um, in need of um, because we're not looking to reinvent the wheel with the network. We are trying to um, prioritize the type of technical support and assistance that um, practitioners around the country would find most helpful. Um, and since we have academic partners on this call as well, there are certainly places where we are looking to collaborate with academic and research partners on on some of this technical assistance as well. So um, again, 
you don't need to limit your responses to just one. And if there's something that you really feel that we are missing and something that you feel would be important technical support and assistance, please feel free to write that in as well. Okay, Beth, what do we, what do we see here? Land use planning tools. Okay, state and local policy tools. Um, very useful to know. So thank you all. We will, um, we will put this into our um, planning and uh, our thinking about next steps on the network. But let me then, let me talk about um, the network and about the Farmland Information Center. If there are those of you who have never looked at the Farmland Information Center website, which is um, farmlandinfo.org, I strongly suggest that you do so. Um, and Beth, if we could just go back to that slide. Um, because it is a wealth of resources. It has information for farmers and non-farming landowners, but it has a huge amount of resources for practitioners, and that goes from policies. So if you are interested in what states have done around state plans for agriculture or state plans that are um, or state goals around retaining agricultural land bases. You can find those types of information in there. You can find information about what states are doing around farm linking, listing, and matching. You can find information about beginning farmer tax credit programs, which are another thing that we think um, can help a lot with that generational transfer issue. Um, you can find information about things that make the case for agriculture and a number of um, resources and academic studies that have been done on all aspects of planning for agriculture, farmland, ranch land protection, um, you name it. So, and if you have a question, if you're looking for a statistic, if you're writing something and you want to know, oh my Lord, what was... Ohio's total land conversion from this year to that year, you can call in and people at the FIC will actually answer the phone um, and can give you that answer. So I highly encourage people to use that as a resource. It is a collaboration we have with NRCS. Um, the network, again, is something that we ha are launching. We have just launched um, it is intended to build the collective capacity of those working around agricultural land protection and those who are looking to retain agriculture, so planners and folks who are thinking about the agricultural land base, soil and water conservation districts, um, organizations that um, are supportive, but may not be directly involved in uh, um, protecting agricultural land, can join as collaborators. As Brian mentioned, we are looking to do a combination of both um, in-depth conversations at the state and regional level to try and have more robust information sharing and that's between both land trusts and many public entities as well. Um, we are also will be doing a large number of virtual, sorry, everything's virtual um, at the moment, webinars starting with policy, looking then to do more land use planning tools at the local level, and we will be adjusting future programming um, based on the feedback we're getting through these webinars. So I hope people will sign up for it. If you have questions, um, please do email me or call me at that number. You can find the sign up form at farmland.org backslash N-A-L-N. Um, it is free. I guess that's the important last point to make. Um, and I think 
unless I can't think of anything else. So Brian Brandt, I'm going to turn it back to you to close us out. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I would really like to thank everyone for uh, participating on the webinar today and all the comments and questions that uh, you were able to put forth. I really want to encourage folks to, to really um, take a look and go to our website and read the overall Farms Under Threat report and, and really dig into the website. Um, um, look, at, look at those kind of spatial analysis and, and policy analysis we've done, not only for Ohio, but the other states and, and really dig into you know, those analysis for Ohio as well. I think there's a lot of other great nuggets of information in there that, you know, obviously in the time allotted, we weren't able to speak to. So, so again, just really encourage all of you to, to visit the website and, and dig into the, into all of that information to, uh, to a greater level. Um, thank you to Chris and Brian Bordage and Beth uh, uh, for taking us through the information and providing some input here. And since we are past, our one hour time frame. Uh, one final thank you and and say goodbye to everyone. So so really appreciate your listening in, listening in today. Thank you. <laughs>